Hi everyone, this video is part two of the 4A series on social psychology for AP psychology students. This particular video will focus on attitude formation and change. As you can see on the unit outline, we are in the second topic of section A. In the previous video, you learned about attributions, which sounds really similar to today's topic, which is attitudes, but they are slightly different. And you'll learn about specific social psychology research studies that are related to attitudes, how they form and how they influence our actions and how and when attitudes can change. These are the key focus questions for today's video. By the end, you should be able to answer each one of them. These are the vocabulary concepts I will explain in today's video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So as I mentioned earlier, in the first video in this series, you learned about attributions, which are the explanations we make about the causes of behavior. Today's video is going to focus on attitudes that we have towards others. And attitudes and attributions sound similar, but they're different. Our attitude is how we feel, and it's usually in reference to how we feel about others or how we feel about events. And our attitudes are usually influenced by our beliefs. Our attitudes can set us up to react to people and things in our environment in specific ways. For example, if we believe someone is threatening, then we may feel anger or fear toward that person, and then we may act defensively towards them. In social psychology, researchers study how attitudes are formed and how they influence our actions. So one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that our attitudes are closely interconnected with our beliefs, our emotions and our actions. So in this next topic, I will look at an example where an attitude about a social group fits into these three components. And that is one, a stereotype, which is a belief or idea. Two, prejudice, which is a negative feeling or emotion. And three, discrimination, which is the negative action or behavior. And you can see that they are detailed in the CED note at the bottom of the screen. And I'm going to go slightly out of order in my explanation, starting with prejudice and discrimination. Prejudice means to make a pre-judgment. So this is when you make a judgment before you know or encounter the thing that you're judging. And prejudice refers to a negative attitude. So this negative prejudgment is towards a group of people and it's usually in reference to a group with a specific characteristic like gender or race, ethnicity, age, or sexual orientation. Discrimination is the behavior that results from our prejudice and it occurs when our negative attitude toward a specific group of people manifests in an action. So discrimination is, is also a behavior, um, but it just like prejudice is unjustified or unwarranted. So when we have an unjustified negative feeling about a person or a group of people that we harbor inside, that is prejudice. And this can result in the unjustified negative action towards that group, which is discrimination. So now let's focus on stereotype. A stereotype is a generalized belief about a group of people which may or may not accurately represent every individual in that group. While stereotypes can sometimes be based on real traits, they often overgeneralize, which leads to mistakes in judgment. For instance, the stereotype that athletes are competitive may be true for some, but not for all. When such a stereotype leads to negative feelings, like disliking athletes, it can become a prejudice. And if that prejudice leads to actions, like excluding athletes from a club, it becomes discrimination. The CED emphasizes that students should not only define stereotypes, but recognize the function in reducing cognitive load. According to the cognitive load theory, our brain naturally seeks ways to simplify information processing, often using mental shortcuts like stereotypes to make quick decisions. This can be helpful, but it can also lead to biased judgments. In 1987, Susan Fisk and her colleagues studied how cognitive load affects stereotype use. Participants were given descriptions of a person either fitting a stereotype or not fitting a stereotype while multitasking with an unrelated audio task. The study found that participants who were under cognitive strain found that they were more likely to rely on a stereotype, helping them conserve the negative resources for the memory task they were listening to. While this made the task 
easier, it also reinforced biased perceptions. And this highlights how stereotypes, though efficient, can lead to inaccurate and unfair judgments. Since stereotypes help manage cognitive load by serving as mental shortcuts, they can often shape something called implicit attitudes. Implicit attitudes are unconscious beliefs that influence our judgments and behaviors without our awareness. Unlike explicit attitudes, which we're consciously aware of, implicit attitudes guide us in ways we don't realize, and even well-intentioned individuals. One important study on implicit attitudes was conducted by Greenwald, McGee, and Schwartz in 1998. They created the Implicit Association Test, which is also called the IAT, which is a reaction time test to measure unconscious biases. Participants sorted white and black faces with either positive or negative words. And the study found that many people were faster pairing white faces with positive words and black faces with negative words, suggesting unconscious bias based on stereotypes. The IAT has since been used to study implicit attitudes on various topics like gender, age, and even political beliefs. Though some question how well the IAT predicts real-world behavior, it remains an important tool for understanding how stereotypes influence our thinking even when we aren't consciously aware of it. So as you can see in the CED note at the bottom of the screen, there are several examples of implicit attitudes that can influence our evaluations of others. They are the just world phenomenon, outgroup homogeneity bias, in-group bias, and ethnocentrism. Let's start with the just world phenomenon. The just world phenomenon is the belief that people get what they deserve and they deserve what they get. This mindset leads people to believe that good things happen to good people and that bad things happen to bad people. And it reinforces the idea that the world is fair and predictable. Psychologist Melvin Lerner and his colleague Carolyn Simmons conducted a study to investigate how people react when they see others suffering. In the experiment, participants watched what they believed was a learning task, which was a woman receiving electric shocks for incorrect answers. The participants had no control over the situation. Over time, instead of feeling sympathy, many of the participants began to devalue the woman, viewing her as less likable, even believing that she deserved the suffering. And this reaction supports the just world hypothesis, suggesting that when people witness unfairness, they start to justify it by believing the victim must have done something to deserve it. This study demonstrates how the just world phenomenon helps people reduce that cognitive discomfort that they are confronted with when they see injustice. Instead of acknowledging how bad things happen unfairly, people may rationalize suffering as being deserved, which can lead to victim blaming in cases of poverty or crime or even in cases of abuse and Assault. And this is the just world phenomenon. We can also have implicit attitudes towards our in group and other out groups. First, let me define those terms. In group refers to a group of individuals we identify with and we feel a sense of belonging to. Oftentimes, we share some kind of similar characteristic with our in group, something that we identify with. It might be the city that we live in, or maybe we share the same neighborhood, we might have the same friend group. Maybe we participate in the same activity or club. We might share the same gender or ethnicity, but for whatever reason, we are in this group and we feel a sense of belonging because we identify with them. And this is our in-group. An out-group is a group which we do not belong to, and we may perceive them as separate or different. People often see their in-group more favorably or even more superior compared to the out-group, and this is what's called in-group bias, which is the tendency to favor members of one's own group over those of other groups. This bias can influence social interactions, decision-making, judgments, and often can contribute to prejudice and discrimination. In 1971, a study by the social psychologist Henry Tajfel and his research partners found that this was very true. What they did was they divided different participants into groups based on something very meaningless, whether they preferred one type of artwork over another. And that was their shared characteristic that put them in their in-groups. Despite having no real connection to the group members and there was no real competition, participants actually still showed a clear preference for the group that they had been assigned to. Um, 
even though it was just randomly assigned based on their artwork preference, participants were more likely to give points and reward members to their own assigned group, even if it meant that their choices were unfair to others in the other groups. This showed how easily people can form in-group biases, favoring their own groups, even when the group membership was based on something as trivial as personal preference for a painting. Outgroup homogeneity bias is our tendency to view members of an outgroup as being the same or more similar to each other while perceiving members in our own group as having nuance and diversity and uniqueness. Homogeneity refers to having characteristics that are uniform and similar. And in the context of social psychology, when we talk about outgroup homogeneity bias, it means that we're looking at the outgroup and we ignore a lot of their differences and we believe that they're all just very very similar. Um, essentially, we're making an overgeneralization about people in that outgroup, and it can reinforce stereotypes, making it harder for us to see individuals in that group as unique. In a 1982 study that followed up on in-group and out-group attitudes was done by researchers named Park and Rothbart, and they also used the pairings of preferences to create random groups as um, having a preference for a certain painting. And But what they were wanting to do is see how participants who were in groups described members of out-groups. And even though the groups were actually arbitrarily assigned, when they were asked to rate outgroup participants, they tended to view them more similarly to each other and often used more generalized terms. Whereas when they described the members of their own group, their in-group that was actually just randomly assigned, they saw them as more diverse and unique and highlighted the very individual differences of their in-group. And this represents outgroup homogeneity bias. And the last example of how implicit attitudes influence our thoughts and actions is through something social psychologists refer to as ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is the tendency to view one's own culture as the standard superior to other cultures, and it can lead to negative judgments about people from different backgrounds. It can also lead people to mistakenly believe that their own group is the center of everything. Ethnocentrism can also lead people to evaluate others and in interpret others' cultural norms uh, based on theirs. And as students of psychology, you are learning that through this course, it's important to evaluate research studies, and it's important that they're going through peer review. And this also is something that peer reviewers will be looking for to make sure that researchers aren't using their own cultural standards when evaluating psychological concepts. And so researchers need to be keenly aware of their own tendencies toward ethnocentrism when they're designing studies or drawing conclusions about generalizability in studies that can only be applied to one cultural group. So in research, ethnocentrism can occur if a researcher assumes that their own culture or their culturally specific practices or ideas are natural or right. So now you've learned that implicit attitudes can influence our thoughts and actions, but we can also be unaware of our tendency to cling to our beliefs that we've established, even when we've been presented with evidence that proves them false. You can see on the screen there are two terms that you need to know that relate to attitude formation and change, and they are belief perseverance and confirmation bias. Belief perseverance refers to our tendency to cling to our beliefs even when we've been presented with evidence that contradicts them. And confirmation bias refers to our tendency to seek out information that supports our existing beliefs while ignoring the information that challenges it. These cognitive biases help explain why people might hold on to their prejudices or stereotypes, reinforcing their initial attitudes without critically evaluating new or opposing information. In the 1979 study by Lord, Ross, and Lepper, the researchers wanted to see how people hold onto their beliefs even when they're given ever information that disagrees with them. They had 192 participants who either strongly supported or strongly opposed capital punishment. The participants read two different research studies, one that said capital punishment helps reduce crime, and one that said it has no effect on crime. The researchers wanted to see how participants would react to conflicting information. The results showed that the participants didn't change their beliefs 
even after reading conflicting studies. Instead, they used biased reasoning, meaning they found flaws in the research that disagreed with their views, and they thought that the research supporting their beliefs was more trustworthy. This showed belief perseverance, which is when people stick to their beliefs, even distorting information to make it fit what they already believed. Now, our final concept is cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is a psychological discomfort people feel when they hold two conflicting beliefs or when they act in a way that contradicts with their beliefs. To reduce this discomfort, which is called cognitive dissonance, people will often try to either change their beliefs or justify their actions, or minimize the importance of the conflict altogether. One of the most famous studies on cognitive dissonance was conducted by social psychologist Leon Festinger in 1957. It was known as the Festinger and Carl Smith study. In this study, Festinger and his colleague James Carl Smith asked participants to perform a boring task. You can see a recording of it on the screen. Participants were asked to turn pegs on a board over and over and over and over for a very long period of time until the researcher told them that the task was over. And then they were asked to tell another person how enjoyable the task was. This was conflicting for them because the task truly was boring and they were asked to tell someone that it was fun. Some participants were paid $1 to lie and while others were paid $20 to lie. Afterward, the participants were asked by the researchers how enjoyable they actually thought the task was. And the results were really interesting. The results showed that the participants who were only paid $1 came back and talked about how enjoyable the task was, while those who were paid $20 we're honest, and they said it was boring. According to the cognitive dissonance theory, the participants who were paid only $1 experienced more discomfort for their behavior of lying because it didn't align with their belief that the task was boring. And then to reduce this discomfort, they changed their attitude and they convinced themselves that the task really was more enjoyable than it actually was. But those who were paid um, $20 did not feel as bad about lying. They felt like the payment was sufficient and they didn't really feel any tension about lying about how great the task was. This study showed that people who felt this strong discomfort between their beliefs and their actions chose to change their beliefs to align with their action of lying because they didn't have good enough justification for lying and saying that it was actually enjoyable. So the cognitive dissonance theory suggests that people feel discomfort when their beliefs and their actions don't match and they're motivated to change one to reduce the discomfort. So let's finish today's video with a few short questions for review. Remember, I'll read the questions and you'll need to pause the video to determine the answer. Question number one says, which statement best demonstrates the difference between prejudice and discrimination? Question number two says, according to the just world phenomenon, people tend to believe that. Question number three says, Sarah is an animal lover who always supports adopting pets from shelters. However, one day she buys a puppy from a pet store instead of adopting one. After making the purchase, Sarah starts to feel uneasy because her action contradicts her beliefs. To ease her discomfort, she tells herself that the pet store puppy was healthier and that she saved a life by purchasing the dog. What concept is Sarah experiencing in this scenario? So this brings us to the end of today's video on attitude formation and change. Make sure to check your answers to the review questions on the left-hand side of the screen and to make sure you're taking away the key concepts on the right-hand side of the screen, you should be able to answer our key focus questions and define our essential concepts.